thank you, thank you so much to you know the organizers for having me here. Uh, I'm even more thankful to be able to work with some amazing postdocs and grad students at UC Santa Cruz. So most of what I'm going to show is basically their work. Uh, so let me give you an outline of the talk. I'm going to tell you about what we know about observations of the R process uh, in a wide range of, of scenarios. I think the observations are getting quite interesting. Then I'll discuss in detail these two astrophysical sites that have been proposed for now almost 30 years, type two and mergers. And I will focus on three aspects. How is the R process made? Uh, where is the R process deposited within a galaxy? And when that mean in the history of the universe as a function of time, which as you know, uh, there's the time delay in, in mergers that it's very, very important. Then I'll talk to you about clues of chemical evolution and I'll show you sort of our first efforts to try to put everything together in a consistent model of the formation of the Milky Way and see if we can actually replicate the fossil record that we see, which are basically our halo stars and the abundance patterns that we see in those stars. Okay, so this is my two minute nucleosynthesis uh, hopefully pedagogical introduction. Uh, Brian showed this plot, which is the proton number and the neutron number. And you have to remember that elements heavier than iron are almost exclusively made by neutron capture. As you know, every time you capture a neutron, you beta decay and you follow this trajectory. Uh, so if you do this slowly, that means that the capture rate is significantly slower than the beta decay time. That's what we call the S process. S stands for slow. And you leave very close to the beta stability valley here in the black points. Okay? Something that I want to highlight is that the abundance patterns that you see are intimately related to the close neutron shells that you see. Uh, here, why is that? Because those, you know, uh, elements basically do not want to capture neutrons. So you can think of it as you have a flow of neutrons coming in, and you get stagnation point in these closed shells. Okay, so this is very, very important uh, to really try to understand the abundance patterns that we see. Now, what is shown here is the beta decay time scale. So that means that if I'm here and I start moving down far from stability, the beta decay time scale becomes shorter and shorter. Yeah? What I show here is an R process pathway of about MeV separation energies, which is relatively standard. The first thing that you realize is it's made very far from stability, which require very, very fast time scales and therefore high neutron densities. Okay. Uh, as you can see, the process of capture stagnates in these neutron shells. Now, because these closed neutron shells are reached at a much lower proton number, this is basically reflected in the abundance pattern that you see. Uh, so let me illustrate this. So the abundance pattern in the S process is basically mark the peaks where these closed neutron shells are basically reached. Why? If you're very far from stability and then you make the R process, then you beta decay. And what you're seeing is basically the projection. The abundance patterns are the projections of at what proton number you reach those closed neutron shells. And as a result, you can think of the S process peaks are basically higher atomic number and the R process peaks are basically lower atomic number. And that's basically what you see. Okay, so about half of the elements heavier than iron are made by the S process and half by the rapid R process. So one element is not exclusively made by one or the other, but as you can see, my favorite peak here, which of course has gold and platinum, is almost exclusively made by the R process. Europium, which I will show, has a very strong oscillation strength, which we can actually see very deep uh, features in stars, is basically used as a tracer of the R process, while barium, for example, is used as a tracer of the S process. Okay. Okay, so let me just give you a brief overview of the observations. I think anyone that likes gold has to be in love with this star, which basically looks not very, very interesting, but it has basically europium or gold enhanced by almost by a factor of 100. Yeah, this is sometimes called the Sneedon star. So it has uh, iron metallicity that it's minus three. But however, what is remarkable here is even though the 
total mass content is significantly higher, the abundance pattern is almost identical to that of the sun, as you can see it here. Yeah, this is the solar R process compared to that star. And ultimately what you're doing is you're basically raising the total normalization, but the abundance pattern is basically very, very similar, if not identical to that of the sun. And this has been basically something that over the last five years, we really have to you know, basically put in firm footing that all of these very low metallicity stars seem to show that the abundance pattern in the R process is extremely robust. So whatever process made the R process has been operated for the age of the universe in a way that is giving you these very consistent abundance patterns. So that's the first, of course, constraint if you want to make the R process. Uh, here I want to show you basically contrast two stars that have about the same iron metallicity, but they have almost a factor of a thousand difference in the mass of europium or R process that they have. Uh, something important to keep in mind is only a few percent of metal poor old stars show these clear R process signatures. And something that is also amazing is the large RMS fluctuations that you see at a fixed metallicity in the europium content. And, I'll turn back to this issue uh, later, which is, uh, in my view, crucial. But just to illustrate here, I want you to focus on the calcium lines in these two stars, which are almost identical. But if you look at the europium, look at the difference in the absorption. Yeah? That's, of course, because the europium content in these two stars are so, so different, despite uh, having very, very similar alpha elements. Uh, there's some difference that you can see here of, of, of carbon enhancement. Carbon enhancement happens in about 1% of that 1% of stars that show that R process signatures. Okay, so if you want to make the R process with type 2, you know that, for example, magnesium is produced in type 2, and this plot should be troubling to anyone thinking about type 2 as the standard mechanism because the magnesium changes here are significantly smaller than the europium changes. And of course, people immediately say, well, not all type 2 can produce europium. Otherwise, it's very difficult to have these very different dispersions in, in metallicity. And I'll talk about how this is crucial, and it's really hinting at a process that is actually rare where the mass per event is significantly higher. The same theme, I think, can be seen in dwarf galaxies, particularly in this recent Nature paper, in which when you look at low stellar systems, you know, that have basically low stellar mass content systems, which of course, if you have an event that is basically very common, you expect them to be very chemically homogeneous and therefore follow the mass metallicity relationship. While if you have something as stochastic, once you start getting to low mass systems, then whether or not you get one or not event will make a huge difference in the enrichment. And you, you see it really clearly here, in which this particular dwarf galaxy has an enhancement that is 50 times larger than dwarf galaxies of similar stellar mass. Yeah, so you're clearly seeing this local high density enhancement in these dwarf galaxies, which again points to a process that is actually more sporadic. And you are already at those low masses in the stochastic regime. Uh, this is another one of my favorite ones, which is basically deep sea measurements of plutonium-244. Uh, here you only have two points. Uh, you have basically the deep sea measurement, which you can use to derive the density, ISM density of plutonium-244, and you have the early solar system. So you have about 4.6 billion years difference, and you realize that you see large variations. Uh, we believe these plutonium actually had to come into the solar system in a dust form to actually make it all the way to the ocean. So what this is telling you is that local enhancement, you can think of the solar system as a, you know, sailing through the ISM and picking variations in the local density enhancements of our process material. And here, uh, there's a nice example that if you have a process that it's basically very common, therefore the local variations are small. If you have a process that is rare, you see larger RMS variations. And I'll show you these in a sort of 3D uh, context. Uh, Okay, so to summarize, we know that it's a robust process, that the abundance pattern, basically whatever process you want to make has to give you this abundance pattern that is very similar to that that we see in the sun. We see large variations in low metallicities. We see large variations in systems that have basically low stellar mass content, which tells you something about stochasticity at those masses. And we also see 
sizable variations in the gas density in the Milky Way over the past 4.6 billion years. Okay, so I'll move a little bit about how these two models contrast. Uh, so we know that there's this unknown origin of at least half of the elements, heavier than iron, those are the R process elements. Uh, whatever mechanism you want to put forward, it has to produce the, you know, about 10 to the minus seven solar masses per year. If you do that over the age of the Milky Way, you get the total mass of R process stored in the halo stars, integrated mass, okay? So this is basically what you have to, produce, and not surprisingly, when you're contrasting these events and you have large uncertainties, uh, the type twos are about once every, you know, once per century, and they produce about 10 to the minus five solar masses, or are thought to produce 10 to the minus five solar masses per event. You multiply that and you get the magic 10 to the minus seven solar masses per year. If you do the same in neutron star mergers, and VQ is gonna tell us about what the exact rate is, uh, but if you have, you know, 10 every mega year or so, with 10 to the minus two solar masses, which we believe you can even get just with the pure tidal tails, you can also get this magic number of 10 to the minus seven solar masses per year. So in terms of production rate, I wanted to just uh, give you an example of this. So I picked my favorite element, which is gold, and I gave you a table so that you remember that basically the gold in the sun has the mass of the largest asteroid uh, on the solar system. A gold mass ejected in a core collapse supernova has the mass of the moon and gold ejected in a merger has the mass of Jupiter, sort of as an order of magnitude for you to remember. So that means that one of these events can basically supply the gold content of about 10 million stars or so, okay? Okay, so how is the R process made? And now, go into a little bit more detail that Brian did. Uh, so something that is very important is you have to think about the time scales have to be small, the densities have to be high, and you really push to either the birth of a neutron star or this merger of two neutron stars. Uh, Brian mentioned this is the famous YE, which of course if you have equal number of neutrons and protons, YE is of 0.5. Uh, in the type two, you have about 100 milliseconds, that's more or less the expansion time. Uh, close to the neutrino sphere of the neutrino-driven wind. The YE is basically relatively high uh, you know, in neutron-rich standards, and the entropy is very large. So initially what you have is basically free nuclei. As soon as you expand, you basically create alpha particles. And one of the bottlenecks is that you require to have these three-body neutron catalyzed reactions to be able to make the targets in which you're actually gonna capture the neutrons, which is carbon-12. Yeah, these of course are three-body interactions and are relatively slow. Uh, something that could happen that you don't really wanna happen for the R process is that all of those neutrons are actually used to make carbon-12 and then you don't have any neutrons left to make the R process. So people usually refer to as you really wanna have basically not of men, you know, an alpha reach process in which you actually have very few carbon-12, but a lot of neutrons. And the problem with that is that that requires high entropy. And that's been basically a problem for, you know, the past 20 years or so. Now, in contrast, the neutron star mergers have these beautiful characteristics that of course they're highly more neutron rich. And in nuclear statistical equilibrium, which is shown here, you not only have neutrons, but you have heavy nuclei. Yeah, so basically the targets are already there given to you by nuclear statistical equilibrium and the entropy basically plays very little role. So I'm gonna not show a movie since uh, Brian did, but if you actually looked at the tidal tails, that very small fraction of material that gets above the scale velocity, which in my view is a guarantee our process uh, source, uh, you can do these calculations. This was done by uh, Luke Roberts, uh, who was a grad student at UC Santa Cruz. And here, what I want you to point out, you know, to see is that in T equals zero, you already have the targets. The neutron capture proceeds very, very quickly, and then you start decaying. And then uh, you can see you have the first, second, and third peak as you basically decay to the valley of stability. And that's ultimately what sets up the structure of the abundance pattern that you see. Okay, so what I'm talking about here lasts, you know, 
a fraction of a second, hundreds of milliseconds, and then we're going to try to put all of this in a framework of basically the age of the Milky Way. Uh, so this is very transient, but all of what I'm going to talk to you after this really, you know, it's about how the Milky Way assemble and whether or not we can distinguish between these two uh, ways of producing the R process. Okay, so someone in the audience had a question about this. I think there is agreement that the material in these tidal tails varies between 5 times 10 to the minus 3 to 5 times 10 to the minus 2 solar masses. The exact answer depends on the equation of state very sensitively because that determines where the two Lagrangian points are based on the compactness of the object. And of course, that also determines the escape velocity of the system. So the escape velocity is about 0.1 to 0.3 C. And the amount of kinetic energy in these tails, despite having very low mass, is comparable to the kinetic energy of a supernova. Okay? And I'll come back to that, uh, which there are some misconceptions in the literature about how those tails expand in the ISM. Okay, so when people talked about the, you know, not paying attention to neutron star mergers as a prime suspect for the R process, they used this argument, which is, well, type two supernova basically happen at their place of birth, and they enrich the universe almost instantaneously, but as maybe Vicky will tell us in a lot of detail, you really need binary stellar evolution to make these neutron star mergers, because as you know, two neutron stars, in order for them to merge in less than a Hubble time, have to be separated by of order of a stellar radius, and therefore going through a phase of common envelope is essential. And then what matters is basically after the common envelope, what's their separation, which ultimately gravitational wave, you know, energy drain and angular momentum drain determines their merging lifetime, which go anywhere between 100 mega years to about 10 giga years, the age of the universe. Yeah, so these basically are not enriching exactly at the place of birth and they take some time delay, yeah? And I think naively, and hopefully I will convince you at the end of my talk that that argument makes no sense, uh, they thought that they couldn't reach, you know, the universe at low metallicity. And the thing to keep in mind is that the mixing time of the Milky Way, you know, the sound crossing time of the Milky Way in the early Milky Way is about a giga year, okay? So really relating time and metallicity at these early epochs is really a mistake. And I'll, I'll prove it to you in a cosmological framework. So ultimately, we, we heard a lot about this. You have the standard uh, star formation rate, and then the delay time distribution is usually well fit by this n equal one, uh, which assumes that the separation is distributed as you know, log a flat. Okay, so where they deposit, we talked about this. Type two deposit basically the elements here in the gas. We haven't really seen one of these kilonova, but if you believe, which I think there's strong evidence in favor that short GRBs are powered by these compact mergers, you can think of this as, you know, this is where they're depositing their metals and they're basically enriching the galaxy from the outside inwards, okay? This is uh, a beautiful work that Luke Kelly did in which he actually showed in a cosmological simulation by giving a kick these binaries get a center of Mach kick velocity of about 200 kilometers per second. If you do that in a cosmological framework, what you find is, of course, a much more extended distribution. Yeah? So these objects tend to enrich the galaxy, not where the half light is, but much more extendedly. So the question is, well, can we tell these two models apart? The type of analogy that I always like to give is that type twos are like, you know, a chocolate cookie that has this very thin glaze of chocolate where the chocolate is perfectly distributed, while neutron star mergers are like a chocolate chip cookie in which all the R process is basically deposited very locally and then the fusion process and mixing process are gonna determine how well those individual sites mix within the galaxy, okay? So in principle, we should be able to look at this framework and say, you know, the imprints of the difference here has to be present in the halo stars in our own Milky Way. Okay, so I'll turn into the clues of chemical evolution. How am I doing? Whoa, okay. The key, I think, in my view, is this difference between the magnesium enhancement and europium enhancement, as I'll talk to you, and hopefully I'll convince you that this really points out to a mechanism that is much rarer than the type two, where the event per, you know, the mass per event is significantly higher than that that you get from type twos. Okay, so 
we try to basically put this framework into a cosmological framework. I want to just make a point here. You cannot see it very well. But ultimately, if you think about dispersion of elements, even though the amount of mass ejected is only 10 to the minus 3 solar masses, yeah, these objects look very, very similar to supernova remnants. You know, they become, of course, spherical. They sweeped up a mass comparable to their own. They started to accelerate. They, of course, started to accelerate much earlier because their mass is smaller. They start becoming more spherical. But ultimately, as you can see, when you compare them with a set of solution, uh, you know, they have a slightly different cooling radius by you know, less than a factor of two. But in reality, they're depositing these uh, elements and mixing them at the same scale that supernova remnants. So if you were to put this in a cosmological simulation using the same prescriptions for feedback of supernova works very well for neutron star mergers. No? And people sometimes misleading, they think that the momentum is the important component here. No, here is the total energy before you start going into the cooling phase. Okay, so I won't have a lot of time to explain you the cosmological framework, but I'll show you a movie to motivate the simulation. So this was done by, again, another wonderful student in Santa Cruz, Javier. Uh, what you're seeing here, the gas is this sort of grayish thing. Uh, the purple is the cold gas that is basically collapsing, and the stars are pink. Yeah? So you can think of this in this framework. We're making a Milky Way analog. As you know, the Milky Way is special because it did not experience a major merger until today. We know it will. Uh, but basically, what you find is a merger tree that is relatively quiet. Uh, so I'm going to stop the movie at the time that the sun is forming because not many things are happening. But you can think of it, well, if we actually inject both type twos and mergers within this framework, we basically pollute the surrounding gas. That gas turns into new stars. What are the properties of those stars that we're forming? And how are they distributed today in our own halo? And as you know, stars are really the fossil record of this chemical evolution, which basically makes this comparison possible. And you know, this simulation, of course, has been tuned to produce the properties that you see in the Milky Way in terms of number of stars, dark matter, and so forth. OK. So what I show here is the star formation rate in the simulation. Uh, this is basically in terms of the core collapse rate per century. Then if you fold in with a 100 mega year delay, what does that mean? That we're not making any neutron star mergers before 100 mega years. And at 1 over tau uh, delay distribution, this is the number of mergers that you get as a function of time. And this is, of course, per mega year. So you should notice the differences in units. These are, of course, much rarer. And we want to make sure that absolutely these two processes produce the same amount of mass, total mass. And here, the mass per event is about 7.4 tens to the minus 5 solar masses per type 2, and 5 times 10 to the minus 2 solar masses for uh, the neutron star mergers. But of course, we, we play with different normalizations and different mass per event. And all results are very consistent. OK, so what's interesting is how do we inject this? Well, type 1a here trace stellar mass. So you can think of it as the stellar mass as a probability distribution that tells you where to inject both type 1a's and mergers. Uh, type 2 basically traces the star formation rate. And those are the prescriptions of injection. Now, not surprisingly, uh, we're clearly getting you know, very good predictions in the alpha enhancement uh, with type 2. But of course, if you're able to produce the the magnesium, you're never going to produce the europium because the RMS fluctuations are larger, while the neutron star mergers actually give you a very good agreement with the data. Yeah? Now, why is this? I mean, it seems in some ways obvious, but why is this being controversial? It's actually really nicely illustrated in this plot. So when people in the past did chemical evolution models, they assume a closed box model. What does that mean? That everything mixes instantaneously. And you get models like this, in which basically the metallicity grows you know, relatively quickly. And then europium basically only gets produced after 100 mega years. And you basically get no stars that are basically enhanced of europium below metallicities of minus 1.5. If we take the average gas metallicity in the simulations, which are basically these blue, we get basically a closed box model. But look at all the stars that we're making at much lower metallicity, which tells you that the average properties of the gas 
basically are not representative of basically the RMS fluctuations here. And within the first giga year of evolution of the Milky Way, the Milky Way is extremely inhomogeneous. Yeah? So if you're lucky enough to be born close to the chocolate chip cookie from that gas that was enriched, you're going to be highly enriched in europium. And if you happen to be born far away from that, then you're going to be depleted. Yeah? Almost there. You promised me one more minute. Uh, the, and the key here is that we have no events produced with delays less than 100 mega years. What that tells you is that, of course, you're comparing here the mixing, the turbulent mixing time scale of the early Milky Way, which is much larger than 100 mega years. Yeah? And that's, I think, being the misconception in trying to rule out neutron star mergers as the primary source of our process in our universe. Uh, we can also look at dwarf galaxies in this simulation. Now, not surprisingly, I show you two examples of objects that have very similar stellar mass. One was basically able to retain significant fraction of the gas at early on, and basically is enhanced compared to the other dwarf galaxy by a factor of 50. Yeah? So again, these large fluctuations of European content at low masses is also captured by these simulations. And finally, if you think about, you know, this is, say, the orbit of our solar system, this is basically thought to represent the European abundance, but of course it's made on gold color, just to uh, grab your attention. As you can see, if you're surfing, uh, in a Keplerian orbit, the spiral arms have some differential velocity with respect to you, and then ultimately you're surfing through these inhomogeneities in europium, which are drastically enhanced when your mechanism is significantly more inhomogeneous. So we're also able to basically reproduce these large variations that we see in deep sea measurements of plutonium. Now, plutonium has a decay lifetime that is only about 81 mega years, so you really very closely link to the nearest event that just happened within that time framework, okay? Okay, so in summary, I hope I convinced you that they are very robust. Uh, the, you know, the abundance patterns change here. I tried to make a compilation of all the groups. Uh, you know, the abundance match is not perfect, but the main features of the R processes, as Brian was also arguing, are well captured. And I think the difference now are relatively small. And of course, when we talk here about the R process, we're talking about the heavy R process. Uh, they're consistent with chemical evolution, large dispersion for low stellar mass systems, and in some ways, the solar system, you know, is surfing through these changes in, you know, plutonium content that nicely represent, you know, what is the local rate in the nearby universe compared to, you know, to nearby compared to our own solar system. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Thanks, Enrico. Uh, I th take a slightly different slo slope on it. I wouldn't say, does this do this or not? I'd say both, both work. The neutrino wind is there, and it's had dire difficulty ever making the, the second R process peak, but it has had great difficulty not overproducing strontium, yttrium, zirconium. So the light R process I would still attribute to, um, to supernovae. I had a question, though. Does I, I, I agree, by the way, with you. And in fact, when you look at the correlations between second and third peak, mm -hmm. they correlate very well. When you see the first peak, it doesn't So that, that leads into my question. Does, does a neutron star merger always make the same R process? Or does some make a stronger R process and other weak R process? And a subsidiary question, do you reach uh, fission recycling or not? The first question, I think, I mean, well, Brian kind of gave you uh, kind of a broad overview that he can basically do almost any any uh, outcome, but I think like the tidal tails, at least the you know many groups that have done are all converging with even different codes, different relatively initial conditions, different YEs. We're all converging to an abundance pattern, at least for the second and third peak that looks very robust. Now, you're absolutely right that something that I didn't touch upon is the peak where europium lies, which I've been using to argue uh, that europium is an R process element. And that one is not related with a neutron close shell, 
and therefore fission, you know, the fragmentation and the fission fragment distribution very strongly you know, matters whether or not you have that peak. So there's two groups of thought. One, that they think that the fission fragment stagnates around the Earth rare peak, and some people that there's some nuclear structure that we still are yet to understand well within these two peaks that is actually creating that intermediate peak. Al Cameron showed many decades ago that with recycling you could get you know, the same result essentially every time. Yeah. But what we also showed with the neutrino wind that you couldn't get the solar R process, just like you can't get the S process from any single exposure. You have to add up a bunch of exposures. Yeah, and I, I mean, I agree with you that, for example, if all the process that Brian was alluding to operate, you start getting into trouble, you know, with the, with the abundance pattern that we see that is so robust. So there's some limits as to how much wiggle room you can have. Uh, Enrico, you mentioned plutonium data. Which data are this? Because we searched for plutonium together with the iron-60. We found iron-60, but never plutonium. No, you, you have data that yeah. show variation? In what kind of data are these? Yeah, so this is just deep-sea drilling. Yeah, that's what we did, too. And there was no, no, never sorry? any plutonium. So this how is could it 244, be which has a half-life of about 81 megawatts. No, no, megawatt. just, just chemically, it's, it's almost, what, what kind of methods have been used to do that? You have to use accelerator mass spectroscopy, these kind of things. Yeah, and, I think and, they and the take highest, the, the highest sensitivity are reached by the Munich group, and they never found any plutonium. So what group found plutonium? Yeah, I, I can point you to the, pipe, to, the, to the Nature paper this year that tried to do that. Oh, it's sort of slightly off the subject, but you, you told us several times and demonstrated the robustness of the distribution of our process elements. It, from that, it's possible, or it must be possible, to set bounds on any change in the fundamental constants, which is a little off the subject of this meeting, but certainly quite interesting. What are those bounds? I mean, I think from this are probably very bad. No, I think you really have to look at fine structure changes, which really give you the more detailed bounds. Uh, these, I think, you know, the uncertainty is large enough that I don't think you can have meaningful constraints. I think you have to look to, you know, structure, fine structure variations, as, you know, with quasars, which is something that, you know, John Bacall did a long time ago uh, that has gotten much, much precise. But I don't think from here we're in a, I mean, you saw the uncertainties. No, you're, you cannot really put any cosmological constraints to that. The closed shells aren't moving around. Sure. Yeah. sure, but the, I mean, the, the changes in, in the fine structure constant, I don't remember the last, but it's one part in a million, one part in, one part in 100,000. So that, that's hard to get with this data. You should also be able to train the weak decay constant. Mm -hmm. No, I agree with you. Last question. I, mean, I just wanted to understand this, this tension you're mentioning, because I, I think we, we all agree that there's this very neutron rich matter that can potentially produce the second and third peaks with some robustness. And we do see variations. I mean, you know, the idea of this, this less neutron-rich component, I mean, it may uh, produce, uh, you know, some of the lighter uh, R process peaks, but probably with more variation because of all the, you know, it's more, you know, because of this issue of fission cycling. So I guess I'm trying to understand what it, so you're saying it's, it's, it's in conflict because uh, we have other sources for making the light R process? Yeah, I can, I can show you some plots that Luke Roberts has generated showing that there's strong constraints on how much uh, you know, blue component you can have and how the abundance pattern is actually more sensitive to the neutrino heating in that regime. 